Hello. Welcome to this edition of our ICANN on Air broadcast. Today, we examine the subject, board dynamics as a tool to improving board effectiveness. Oh, well, of course, the importance of boards is evidence from the multiple of roles that boards are required to undertake. And of course, the new challenges of the 21st century, such as cybersecurity, activist investors, loss of trust of the society into the companies, and a volatile external environment has forced but to re-examine their roles. Bots are now dynamic and of paramount importance because they possess the essential skills, the networks, and the expertise to guide the organization in this changing and volatile environment. Joining me on a question and answer segment to interrogate these practical insights for a better understanding is a chemical engineer. Uh, yeah, a chemical engineer and a fellow chattel accountant from Nigeria. She's an FCA. Tommy Adekpojo are her names. She is the partner and head of the International Audit, Governance, Risk and Compliance Services of KPMG Nigeria. She was a member of KPMG project management team that played a pivotal role in assisting the committee set up by the Securities and Exchange Commission of Nigeria to review and redesign the SEC Code of Corporate Governance issued in 2010. She was also a key member of the technical committee set up by the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria to review the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance, where she led KPMG, a team of the KPMG, providing technical secretarial assistance to the committee. More to showcase on our esteemed guest very shortly. And also, on this segment of the program, it led you to a bit of teeth, bits of uh, Akandari, and of course, Adbat. If you want to sit back and please stay put, we shall go full blast very shortly. Are you ready for exponential results this year? Do you desire and seek to build economic value and wealth on a consistent basis? We are proud to introduce to you the 4th ICANN Malaysia International Conferences. The theme is Building Economic Resilience, Navigating Turbulent Times Through Digital Transformation. This year's conference has been put together to empower and equip participants with the needed shift for personal, professional and institutional transformation. The conference dates, the 16th to the 19th of May 2022. Venue, Adya Hotel Langkawi Kedah, Malaysia. For further inquiries please send a mail to chairman at ican-malaysia.org or info at ican-malaysia.org. You can also visit our website https colon slash slash ican-malaysia.org to register for the conference now. 
can also reach out to us through the following contact numbers currently being displayed on the screen. Plus 60163206413, plus 62812157235806076197282. Plus 234803350276 plus 2348067908190. We look forward to your registration and participation at the conference. If you're ready to start your registration and payment process, please contact one of our friendly coordinators or simply visit the website to complete your registration. The website is https colon slash slash ican malaysiaorg Thank you. We're looking forward to seeing and connecting with you in Malaysia. Please join me to welcome Tommy Adepoju on to ICANN on air program. Tommy, you are welcome. Thank you very much, Aki. Beautiful. And then we just go full blast. Usually, I, I, I always like to conceptualize so that people can really understand. One, I don't want to assume that we will all get the definition of terms, especially for our students, for them to get a proper feel of this subject of board dynamics as a tool to improve board effectiveness. And so I start by asking you to give us an overview. I'm asking you, really, what is board dynamics? Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. Um, I will um, define board dynamics as the way individual board directors you know, on every company, you have different categories of governance structure. You have the shareholders who own the company. They appoint people to help them provide oversight on what management who are there on a day-to-day -day basis are doing. So you have the board of directors who provide the oversight. And so that board dynamics refers to the way individual board directors interact with each other in carrying out their duty as directors with the objective of collectively generating economic value for the organization and the shareholders that put them there. So when you're talking about board dynamics, really you're focusing on the actual and perceived roles, behaviors, attitudes in the boardroom. And this helps us to be able to understand the kind of culture the organization has so we are talking about how the board behaves, or in some cases, how they misbehave, <laughs> because that also happens, rather than the tasks they've been asked to do. We are also talking about how they hold discussions, rather than what exactly they are discussing. So it's these soft issues. It's more the interactions between the board members, whether individually or collectively, and the way they talk to each other, the way they debate on the board, the way they challenge um, each other, the way they make decisions, the way they're able to influence even the wider stakeholder community. And all of this come together to differentiate between a board that you will say is effective or another board that you will then say is dysfunctional. So in, in a short word, they're just talking about the overplay of the interactions, which can be between different parties on the board. It can be between the chairman and the CEO. It can be between the non-executive directors and the executive management. It can also be between the executive management as a whole. And, among, and then also even the board and the people that put them there who are the shareholders. So that's what I will define board dynamics to mean. Beautiful, beautiful. Certainly, certainly, to me, um, in those broad categorization that you have given us, there must be elements, there must be factors um, that influence good board dynamics. Isn't it? What are they? Very good question. Yes, there are indeed various elements or factors that influence um, board dynamics. And I would like to categorize them into three main buckets. Um, the first bucket I would say is the board composition. 
What do I mean by the composition of the board? How is the board made up of? A board is typically seen or likened to a football team. You know, in a football team, um, for the people that like football here, you have to assemble an A team that can go and achieve the objective. So for you to have a successful team, um, it's fundamental that you have the right people around the table. And this is also very applicable to the board. For you to assemble the right people around the table, then the leaders of the board have to be deliberate. In the past, we have situations where um, somebody wants to get someone on the board and people just look around their own network, oh, who is that person I know, my old school boy, you know, or somebody, a relative somewhere, and it then becomes what you call a boys club. But gone are those days. What you have now is a deliberate effort to ensure that you have the right people on the board. So the starting point is saying, what kind of skill set, what kind of competency is required on this board, knowing the strategy that we are trying to achieve. So when we look into the future and we see what we, the, what we want the organization to achieve, what kind of people should we assemble together that will enable us get there? That's the starting point. So you call that looking at, I mean, having a profile of a prospective board member. When you have that profile, that then moves us into then saying, let's go and do targeted recruitment. Let's find the specific people that match that particular profile that we've put together. And in coming up with the profile, we are looking at several things, both hard and soft things. The starting point is even asking ourselves, what kind of experience do we require? If it's an organization, for example, that is um, operating in the banking sector, you don't want to assemble only ex-bankers across the table. When you do that, you then start having group thinking because everybody is thinking along the same line. There's no fresh perspective that's being brought to the table. Rather, you want to have some people that have industry perspective. You also want to have some people that have specific technical skills that will be required as you deliberate on the board. So you are talking about maybe risk management, um, legal skills, for example, because you will get into a lot of um, contract discussions or legal discussions that you need to have somebody that understands all of those that can bring the value to the table. You also want to then, moving from the technical skills, you want the industry content because you can also have a group of people talking that don't understand the industry or understand the business that they are actually discussing. And if I just give a slight example, there was a board that um, um, we were doing the evaluation some years back. And this board, they had been taking some dis decisions um, the management were bringing to them. And when, when I started asking them questions, did you really understand um, this decision that you were taking um, or this new product that they brought to you? And they confessed that they didn't really understand it. Rather, what they were doing was that whenever management brought the decision to the board, they will ask management, management, are you sure this is OK? Have you dotted your I's and crossed your T's? And once management says yes, they will sign off. Eventually, that created a major hole in their balance sheet because they didn't understand the industry and the business. So that is also very important. You also then need to have people that have personal attributes, which is the softer side. People that, I mean, I mean, that have personal attributes and also the diversity of the board because you don't want to bring the same kind of people. So when you then start talking about diversity, you are talking age diversity. You don't want an aging board. Sometimes you look at a board of directors and the average age on the board is 65. And some of the products they are selling are for the youth. So how do you then want to understand the youth perspective, the customer's perspective of what they want to see? So on the board, you then need to have a stagger, I mean, different age categories so that you are able to have various viewpoints on the table. When you're also talking diversity, you also want to talk about gender diversity. Gone are the days when you enter into a boardroom and everybody is a male. You need to have balanced boards because there have been several researches that have been done that have shown us that indeed when you have women on the board, it's extremely beneficial to the board. They bring a lot of skills to the table from pulling the men back who are more aggressive um, to helping you take better decisions. I mean, several research has been done in that area without having to go into it. You also need to look at balancing the geographical perspectives. 
either from a racial perspective or a tribal perspective. If you have a business that's operating across the country, you don't want to put everybody from one particular area. How do you then appeal to the other stakeholders who are operating in other areas when everybody they see on the board is only from one side? So being mindful of that is also very, very important. At the same time, you are trying to balance having non-executive directors, executive directors, and the category of directors you call independent non-executive directors who bring a higher level of independent thinking and questioning to decisions that are taken on the board. So when you pull all of this together, we then have I mean, a better board composition. The second area is looking at the personal attributes and the behaviors on the board. So you want a temperamentally balanced board, a board that you have people, there are some people, when you look at them, they are analytical thinkers. Once you give them something, they're able to itemize it and really break it down for you. There are some other people who are more visionary. They only see, they are able to conceptualize things into the future. While some are living in the now, you need a balance of different people on the board. You have some people that are challengers, every single thing they are challenging and trying to dig to the bottom. While there are some other people that are what you say, they are conciliators. So though that balance ensures that you are not having friction on the board or a situation where people are banging the table all of the time. There are some that are better listeners, while there are some other people that talk a lot. So looking at all of this helps us to then en ensure that we're able to balance those soft skills that will enable us to have people that are courageous, that, have, that make critical assessments, and are able to bring that honesty, openness, and tact even to the decision making on the board. The last area is what I would say um, is the boardroom culture. That's another factor that affects um, dynamics, dynamics on the board. And in culture, we are just saying the, the way we do things, the way we take our decisions. Do we take our decisions in a collegiate manner or are, are we always wanting to vote? What kind of culture exists on the board? Are people able to challenge um, decisions being put on the table or do they have to look at people's faces to know, oh, if this one is saying no, this one is saying yes, what should I say? You understand? So that's that kind of culture where people are able to have differing viewpoints and bring their opinions to the table and make decisions without animosity. That is also an area that affects um, board dynamics. So I will say those three areas, the composition of the board, personal attributes and behavior, as well as the boardroom culture, are the categories of factors that I will say affect um, board dynamics. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tommy. So, so now, 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 now let's dive. Um, what are the provisions within a Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance regarding board dynamics? Quite a lot of provisions, actually. Um, if we look at the code, the code is actually very detailed um, because it was patterned after, after best practices in other jurisdictions that have been practicing corporate governance for a very long while. Um, and so if we're starting from um, even the second principle in the code that talks about board structure and composition, you already defined what we should look at for in structuring the board and the kind of composition, just like some of the things I had previously mentioned. If you also look at um, um, principles three to eight, those areas focus specifically on the roles and responsibilities of principal officers of the board, starting with the chairman what should be the responsibility of the chairman? What should be the responsibility of the CEO, of the any non-executive director, the independent non-executive director, as well as um, the executive management team? It also goes ahead to talk about the appointment process. That's in principle 12, and lays out how, what kind of, what we should do in trying to appoint a director. I mean, go out to look for the people, ensure that they meet the criteria, and then issue a letter of appointment to them so that everybody knows why they are there, what are their KPIs, and how will they be evaluated at the end of the day. When we look at um, principle 11, it talks about the responsibility of the board as well as its committees on the board, such that you then force the board member, board, the board to have what you call terms of reference for every committee they have on the board, because when you know your roles and responsibility, that provides clarity in terms of what you need to do and what you shouldn't do. Um, there's also principle 10 that talks about meeting proceedings. How should meetings happen on the board? 
principle nine that talks about um, board members should be able to have access to independent advice. And then, of course, there's principle 13 that talks about training, training the board members, ensuring that whatever new things are happening out there, I mean, in the society, they are able to be on the cutting edge of knowledge, and also ensuring that when we bring in new people onto the board, induction happens for them immediately, and they are better able to understand um, the kind of company that they are coming into to provide oversight. The last one is um, on um, the principle 14 and 15, that then says that on an annual basis, the board should carry out an evaluation of itself, and also do an evaluation of its corporate governance practices. So all of these principles are in the code of corporate governance and all these point out to things that will age the dynamics of the board thank you very much to me uh you, you are flying and i'm going to ask you to be a bit static we're going to go into dynamics and i'm going to paint just a brief scenario in the real world two will not all always add to two to make four uh, so we could have a chairman and we could have a non-executive director. Uh, the soft skills that you mentioned are just not moving in the right direction. Uh, I'd like to ask you specifically, so what role can that chairman and that non-executive director play to improving board dynamics? Okay, um, very good ones. And I think I've, we've, there have been several situations where the relationship between the chairman and the non-executive directors is not in the place where it should be or sometimes between the non-executive and some other category on the board you that happens a lot and it's natural because we are talking about behaviors of people even in in individual houses where you have your own spouse or you have your brothers and sisters we have disagreements the important thing is how do we manage those disagreements and behave in an agreeable manner such that we can disagree but not necessarily be disagreeable. So I will start by talking about the chairman. Um, it's important that the chairman on the board understands his role, that he is just the first amongst equals, but you are all board members. The chairman needs to understand that board members must be treated equally and in a respectful manner at the same time. I've seen some um, chairman of board that um, sometimes talk about, talk, talk, talk to um, other board members in a very, um, they talk down to other board members and those sort of things cause problems on the board. So they have to ensure, remember that they are first among equals. The chairman also, he should be a good listener. When you are a good listener, you are able to aggregate and get from Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. C before being able to come to a decision. If you are not a good listener, you end up having your own biases and what you are thinking in your heart, such that even before the other person lands, you're already cutting him short and saying, no, that's not what I'm saying. And those are the kind of things that create friction on the board. So the board chairman has to listen well he should never be the first one to put his views down. He has to listen to all other people before putting his own views down. Because if he puts down his own views ahead of others, those that are not as courageous on the board may not want to air their views, especially where what they think is different from what the chairman thinks. He should also have very good people management skills and diplomacy skills because you are managing a team. And so you have to be able to understand personalities, understand how to talk to people, understand how to tease out and result, answers and results from people, especially when they are having heated discussions, how to douse the tension and ensure that the board is still able to get to the right decision. On the yeah. other hand, the non-executive director has to be a good team player because you are part of the team. And so you have to be able to contribute your quota and recognize that the strength of the board as a team is in leveraging the individuality of everyone. It's not all about you. It's about the company. It's about the best, taking the best results for the company. And so when people approach boardroom, knowing that they are there to ensure that the company moves forward, 
they are then able to forget about themselves and discuss in a way that you can actually come to an agreeable decision. And the non-executive director as well, um, ensuring that he stays on his lane. You are a non-executive director. You are not an executive management. We've seen a lot of non-executive directors that try to micromanage executive management. When that happens, you also then start having all sorts of friction on the board because as a non-executive director, your role is to have your eyes into the business, but your hands must be out of the business because you are not meant to be hands-on. The people that should be hands-on are the executive directors. So your role is oversight. This is what we've asked you to do. Have you done it? How did you do it? Are we fine with the way you've done it? And then we move on. Your role is not to come and do it. I've been, I've seen a board where the, um, the non-executive directors wanted to come and sit in at management committee meetings and listening to the way they are running their meeting and having discussions. When you start doing that, then you're crossing the line because that then becomes micromanagement. So I would say, I mean, everybody has his role to play and people should stay and play the role that they've been asked to play on the board. Excellent. And thank you very much, um, uh, to me. Uh, not, not a time for non-executive directors to now be, what do we call them? Downtown army boss or meddlesome interlopers. Uh, looking at emotional intelligence, uh, the doctor is saying is asking a question that is being flashed on the screen that how can the behavior well, the character of the chairman well the CEO influence positively or negatively on the dynamics of the board it can it very much imp imp impact on the dynamics of the board so if you have a board chairman that understands personality traits and can play to people's strengths, it helps. So for example, a board meeting is happening. Um, you find that there will be some very strong dominant personalities on the board. There will be some other people who are not as vocal, but they do. They probably may be the ones that actually have the most content. The chairman, based on his character, needs to then be able to pull everybody out find a way to make the one that's talking too much to calm down and allow other people to talk in such a way that the person doesn't feel disrespected, but you are also able to pull the other ones that are quiet on the board. So the, 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 for, for us to choose a chairman, it's important that we need to look at the, the disposition of the chairman, the kind of character of the chairman, because there are certain character traits that are extremely important I mean, it cannot be somebody that is very abrasive. It cannot be somebody that is always impatient because then you won't listen to other people and you will not be able to lead others aright. At the same time, you also find some people that are extremely slow and because they are very slow into taking actions or even in understanding, board meetings can take eight to 10 hours. Whereas the things they are discussing are things that can easily be dealt with in three to four hours. So. Looking at all of those soft skills, even during appointments, are very important. There are some organizations that actually do psychometric testing um, for some of their directors just to try and understand um, the various attributes and characters of the different individuals and then know how to, whether there are developmental needs that they need to then train the people on or whether if the de developmental needs are too much, then maybe the person may not be suitable for the particular role. Mm. Fantastic. And then uh, following with uh, Yusuf, Olani always flashed a question on the screen. Um, what is the level of power of independent non-directors? Can they obtain executive director's decision in a case of different opinion? So the independent non-executive directors are on the board to bring independent um, perspectives, mindsets, and constructive challenge to, to discussions on the board, but they are also part of the board. They are not higher than the other people. They are all working together as a team. And so on the board, you have the non-executive directors. You have those that you've classified as independent. And the reason why you've classified them as independent is because one, either they do not have any material business relationship with the organization, 
or they do not have any relationship with the major shareholders who can exert influence upon them, or they've not worked in the organization, I mean, for at least a period of three to five years, depending on the particular industry, because various industries have put um, particular provisions for the independent non-executive director, and they are not earning any additional remuneration from the organization. So when you have people that meet that criteria, you call them independent non-executive directors. Now, when this, the management bring decisions to the table or bring proposals to the board for consideration, everybody would need to debate on it. At the end of the day, the whole board needs to then take a decision. Depending on the culture of the board, if decisions are taken by consensus, that means some would say yes, some may have said no, but if most people said yes, then clearly the decision would get carried. If most people say no, then definitely you cannot go ahead. So in the, the particular question you are asking, it will depend on the circumstance. So if executive management brought something to the board and the majority of the other board members that are not executives are not comfortable with it, they can indeed say no or they can tell management to go back and rework it. You do not have to say yes. Sometimes we find situations where the proposals from management come in very late, maybe a day or two before the meeting, rather than at least seven days, which should be the standard, or sometimes even on the day of the meeting. And so the others are not able to have sufficient time to digest, ask questions and understand it. If you find yourself in that category. The board can take a decision that they are not going to approve it now. We can step it down and reconvene another meeting to look at it when we are more comfortable. Or we can tell management to go and get um, further information that will make us comfortable. So as long as you are not comfortable, then you shouldn't really approve something. Um, we've seen, I mean, when we look back at organiz organizations that have had governance failures in the past, one of the things that caused governance failures is when board are pressured to take decisions or because there's a major there's a dominant party on the board that is trying to force decisions in his or her own way then everybody goes along even though they are not convinced that they should go ahead that can lead to a failure on the board and that should always be avoided fantastic and um Olu is talking about shadow directors how effective is their role First of all, the code is very insistent that there's, when you say you are, well, let, let's try and define who a shadow director is. So on the board, the only people the, the code of corporate governance recognize on the board are the non board members, which is the non-executive director, the independent non-executive director, and the executive directors. Any other person, that is attending board meetings and having influence on the board is then deemed to be a shadow director. And that means that you are liable if anything happens, even though you are not listed as a director on the paper, on paper, but because you are assuming that role of a director, you are definitely liable and you can actually go to jail if anything happens within the organization. So, it's not encouraged to have shadow directors. It's not best practice. Mm. If you, you are either a director listed there or you are not, why are you staying behind the scene to be teleguarding people? Mm. Mm. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. And then we'll, we must get on our mark with any here uh, when it says that the kind of board chairman approve management proposal without the knowledge of other directors. If no, what is the implication? So the question I will ask is, um, is there a delegation of authority framework within that organization that has defined matters that's reserved for the board and the various of, I mean, officers on the board? The board chairman is not the board. The board chairman is just the chairman of the board. The persons that have authority to approve things, depending on what they have on the delegate, delegation of authority, it's either the board as a whole and not the chairman. There are some instances where the board can then say they are delegating authority to the chairman to approve a particular item. But all of those, I would always encourage, must be documented in the delegation of authority framework. So the delegation of authority framework would state the matters 
that are reserved for the board, what management can start and do on their own, even the things that need to go to shareholders for approval, because the board also doesn't have full authority, depending on this particular item that needs to be approved. So it will be a, thought, a sort of um, aberration if the board chairman is always approving management proposal without the knowledge of other board. That's definitely not good governance. Things must come to the board. It must be discussed at meetings and the whole board must take the decision, not one individual on behalf of the board. Of course, uh, naturally documented for evidence. Thank you very much, Tommy. And uh, now, what techniques will you recommend for board members to disagree without being disagreeable? I notice you use that terminology. I've just told you it. What techniques will you therefore recommend for board members to disagree without being disagreeable? Okay, various several things that can help. Um, I think the starting point is even saying let's get things documented on the board so first of all do we have what you call a board governance framework where we have codified the terms of reference of even the board itself the authority of the board the terms of reference of the board committees and their authority even of the management committees that we have all of those must always be documented i've seen um, an organization where the managing director sat some very senior um, um, management staff within the organization without recourse to the board. The board only got to know from outside. When the board got to know, and then they now summoned the managing director into the, I mean, for disciplinary committee, the, the MD said, look, I don't have anything documented that says I cannot do this. There's, no, there's nothing here that says it's not within my authority limits. And there was actually nothing documented. And that's why I keep talking about delegation of authority limits. Having documented terms of reference is very important. Code of conduct and ethics is also important. In many organizations, we document code of conduct for the staff. But we don't include the directors in that code of conduct. It's extremely important. There's a way you have to behave on the board. It's not your own house. It's, it's, it's a place where we are coming to, to deliberate and take decisions that will move an organization forward. And our actions or inactions would have effect on that organization. So what, is, what are the acceptable behavioral patterns on the board? Is it allowable for us, for example, to, to dis, disclose the things that we, are, that we are seeing on the board to other third parties? Is it allowable for us? Is it allowable for people to work in, to not come for meetings, or is it allowable for people to trade in, 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 in information that we are seeing and use it for their own gain? So we have to have a code of conduct and a code of ethics that details out the values and set of behaviors that is expected of the directors, even from when they are appointed. I've spoken a lot about um, delegation of authority. I won't talk about that again. The other tool I would say, it's even having, um, a robust process to appoint people onto the board. We see sometimes situations where people have been on the board forever and ever. There's no refreshing, refreshment of the, of the skill set on the board. And when people have been on the board forever and ever, they've lost every form of independence. They see themselves as management. They begin to collude with management against the organization and the shareholders. And that is really not, um, not, not very good. So we should also have situations where we've documented our appointment process and policy. What's the tenure of anybody that's coming onto the board? How long can the person stay? Even if you say the person has four or five tenures, must the person stay on the board if he's not performing well? We struggle in this part of the world to actually get directors who are not performing to exit the board. Those are part of the tools that improve dynamics on the board because people then know that we are here for a particular purpose and we need to do what we've been put here to do and we need to contribute and add value to the organization. Induction is also a tool that can help um, because when we conduct um, induction, immediately people are brought onto the, the organization. They are able to learn facts about the organization very quickly. They understand the culture, the expectations for them as directors, the kind of um, behavior that is expected, and they are able to run from day one. 
most times when you see um directors that orientation doesn't happen for they really are not they, they can sit in meetings for three consecutive quarters and not make a sound or say anything even in four hours meeting because they are watching everybody and trying to know am i supposed to talk now or am i not supposed to talk now all of that doesn't help and board evaluation is also a tool um, that helps and of course continuous in, I mean, review of the board processes are also things that can help to ensure that um, our dynamics are in the right place beautiful thank you and then i'll quickly just take my um uk district representative ronke adeagbo um, asking uh, what i would like to describe <laughs> as non-ending questions i always get this all the time that some organizations will have the same person as chairman and ceo and this person of course usually is the founder and is he or she might be the majority shareholder the question is is this good practice and what will you recommend to be the correct framework benchmark for such, where you find yourself in such a situation. Okay, thank you very much. I think very, very interesting and good question. Um, in Nigeria, one of the things we try to ensure that we provided clarity on in the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance is this delineation between the different roles on the board. It is not acceptable for you to be the chairman and also to be the MD CEO. From a leading governance perspective, it is not acceptable. And in most parts of the world, it's actually not encouraged. I think the only the, the few places you still have it today um, are probably in the US. Uh, but in every, if you check every other code of corporate governance, most people have actually sought to separate the position of the chairman and the CEO, because that then is too much concentration of power in one person. There's no check and balance anymore. And so if you look at the code of corporate governance in Nigeria, it says that the chairman of the board should be a non-executive director and should not be involved in day-to-day -day operations of the company, which should be the primary responsibility of the MDCU and the management team. So it is very clear here that you cannot, as, as long as you are covered by this code, you cannot be the chairman and MDCU at the same time. It's not really the best. Beautiful. Thank you very much um, for, for, for that clarification, uh, Tommy. Um, I do not think, uh, personally speaking now, um, I will let you off the hook. And I'm going to get back before I hook you, uh, as we say. Um, let, let, let me take this from um, Abel Aibodion saying says the nation's corporate governance code requires entities to comply and explain rather than comply or explain why is this so very good question and i think this came up quite a lot when the code was being developed um so after i mean when the uk brought out his um UK Code of Corporate Governance, and um, I think that was the one before this particular one. They, and then also um, in South Africa, they had uh, King Three or so. It was clear looking at the results they were seeing that when you have a comply or explain um, philosophy, that's a code philosophy. When you have a comply or explain code philosophy, what it means is that is at the liberty of each of the entity of the organizations to decide when they want to explain off non-compliance. And so they were seeing situations where companies were not complying with the principles of the code of corporate governance, neither were they explaining to their shareholders why they were not complying, because they, it was left to, their, to them to do. And so some other um, countries that were then coming up with codes after that based on research um, I mean, by, by, by researchers, it became clear that it may be better to actually use a comply and explain provision like you have um, in Malaysia, in Singapore. Uh, and because comply and explain means that, first of all, 
it is you are expected to apply the provisions of the code and nigeria's code is actually apply and explain you are expected to apply the provisions of the code applying means it's applicable to you you should do it however where you are saying that maybe because of your the phase where you are your growth phase or where you are within your 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 lifespan there may you may not be able to to comply at this particular point in time or apply that provision then i probably may do something else but i would explain what i have in place as a mitigating strategy that still sort of meets the provisions of the code so that's why the and the and means that you should do both you should say what you are doing and tell us why you are doing it and how you have met the provisions of the code knowing where we are in nigeria oftentimes when we use all people will not do anything and so it was clear that we needed to have and so that we can also ramp up our governance and be able to showcase to the world that indeed we have the basic minimum acceptable governance standard um, that's expected of organizations and we are able to our organizations can compete anywhere in the world super fantastic uh, like lawyers will say there will not be any room for a lacuna and um i was talking about hooking you um in the institute of chartered accountants of nigeria on the old chapter new chapters are at the forefront gender car gap equality and making sure that uh, equal opportunity uh, for all and so the hooking will be this question i'd like to ask you that one reason for scarcity of women as executive directors is the notion of glass ceiling glass ceiling <laughs> in career advancement in your experience tommy do women really suffer from glass ceiling and if they do what advice would you give to upcoming women, women who are professionals to mitigate such glass ceilings? That is if they exist. Yes, indeed it exists. That is the major reason why last month was international. We celebrated International Women's Day because we needed to bring some of these issues and biases to the fore. Um, and they exist in different ways. And, 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 and you know, statistics have shown that um, while more women are seen at the entry level of organizations, by the time they are rising to the senior levels within the organization, a lot of them have dropped out. Why have they dropped out? Different things. It may be that they've dropped out at the point of marriage, they've dropped out at the point of childbearing, or they've dropped out because of several, I mean, the, the, um, the, is not, the environment is just more conducive to help them balance um, their lives as women. And it can be, the, 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 these barriers can be different things. It can be industry or structural barrier where because of our, of our cultural setting or because of the way we think, we expect that a particular industry is only meant for men. I studied engineering. In my class with about 200 people, we probably were less than five that were ladies because everybody feels engineering is for men. I was talking to a, a lady the other day. She owns a manufacturing um, business where she produces um, foundries, um, 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 the things for, for uh, I think, for, for building houses. And most people, she said, um, somebody introduced a customer to her and told the person to call the MD, gave the number. And the man called the number and the, was like, oh, I would like to talk to MD of XYZ. And she said, oh, yes, you are speaking to the MD. He said, no, it cannot be. The MD of this company has to be a man. This is a man's industry. And the person dropped the phone. That was just two weeks ago. So those biases are still there. We've had situations where people have been told, ladies have been told that, look, your place is in the house. I mean, I expect my wife to be in, at home in the kitchen. I'm not, I mean, competing with me in, 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 the, in the office. We've, had, we, we've seen situations where it's the man of the house that comes to drop the, the resignation letter for the spouse because he says, oh, when I was growing up, my mother was always in the house. 
I want a situation where my children are growing up. My wife should also be in the house. Those are barriers that will prevent women from being able to get that. What do we need to do? One, we have to be intentional as women. We need to set goals for ourselves. It is possible to have a good career, also have a good home if you choose to get married, and also be able to express yourself in all of the dimensions of the giftings you have within you. It is possible. Set a goal and work towards that goal. Ensure that you are developing yourself. You have the skill sets that will take you to that next level. So you have to continue to sharpen your skills. You've got to be visible. You cannot be in your stay in your own bathtub and expect people to see you. So you've got to be deliberately out there attending seminars, seeing people network. Don't leave it to the men and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I don't want to. Or even when you then go to the networking environment, you stay at the back and you're not talking to anybody or even exchanging ideas with people. You've also got to learn to speak out. Nobody is going to advocate for you if you do not advocate for yourself. Don't be shy to promote your skills. Speak out. And lastly, look for mentors and sponsors because these always are helpful as well. Beautiful. Excellent. Time always not our friend. And I thank you um, very much, uh, Tommy. Uh, the bias about being um, in another... <laughs> In the in in the living room or in the kitchen, and um, some people say in the other room. What, in closing, will be your final words on this subject of board dynamics as a tool to improve board effectiveness? Thank you very much. Um, I would say, having appraised so many boards of directors, I've seen boards that are effective. I've seen boards that are not operating effectively. I would say it is clear that board dynamics are a central driver in producing great and strong organizational results. Boards have to be deliberate in creating that right dynamics and culture. Um, a high performing board are those where the board and management team are working together as a team. They are maintaining a culture of trust and mutual respect for one another. They are having effective engagement and communication, listening to each other and communicating effectively. And they have tolerance for opposing views and avoiding polarizations on the board. That somebody is dissenting doesn't mean the person does not like you. So for me, those would be the final word I would, I would like to have on this. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you for um, being our guest and for being so lucid, for being able to add brains and bronze to this discussion to me. And I also like to thank our online participants for your incisive questions. Beautiful. Thank you. I will quickly make this announcement that the Information Technology Conference is going to hold from April 8, 2022, virtually. And the theme is governance, risk, and compliance in a digital world and the accounting profession. For further information, please call 090 5384 to fall. And to also announce to you that our Icon on Air airing continues Tuesdays, Thursdays, and our next episode will be on Tuesday, April 12, 2022. The time will be 6 p.m. West African time on Icon Social Media, the YouTube, and the Facebook. If you want to tell somebody, to tell somebody else, to join you at our next episode. And the topic we are going to be looking at is cyber security. What professional accountants must know and do. And we'll be having as our guests, Tokme Aladenusi, BSC, CISA, CISSP, CIA, CEH. He is the risk advisory leader of the light West Africa and has provided technology assurance and advisory services to over 30% of the companies quoted on the stock exchange and 85% of the commercial banks in Nigeria. 
He has served 75% of the GSM companies in Nigeria. Of course, that includes several multinational manufacturing, oil and gas companies, as well as government institutions. He's worked in, in Nigeria, he's worked in Ghana, he's worked in Togo, he's worked in Cameroon, he's worked in South Africa and the UK. And he has also served as clients in clients advisor in 16 countries spread around the world. Now, my dropping of the nuggets for today, and I quote, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go to get together. End of quotes. That's an African proverb, you know? And so the sun sets on an icon on air program for today to rise again, as earlier announced on April 12, 2022. So you'll be the change you like to see. And until then, I remain Aki Fatunke, your anchor, icon on air. Bye for now. <laughs>